plein air landscape painting uh, using the type size method. Uh, some people have asked just about the, the easel and the palette, the, the mast here. This is just a, um, it's a really, it's a very lightweight um, camera tripod. I actually have a couple of them. The, um, they're kind of fragile. That one broke when I stepped on it recently. Um, but it actually still works fine. I just a little, I have to sort of fit it in. They're very lightweight. They're great for traveling. This is a mast I made out of carbon fiber just wrapped around balsa wood. This is made just wrapping carbon fiber and wood veneer around a little foam box putting it in the back and back. The point of this stuff is that it's very lightweight. The, um, the downside, as you'll see when I work, is it moves. It gives it a lot of kind of bounce while I'm painting. But it's something I've gotten used to, and I'd much rather have the, um, you know, I fly with this stuff. I have a, actually a bigger one that I just made too. And in here, there's a, you know, a, a width panel box. I'm using these um, panels that are made out of foam core with a, uh, Classens linen on the front. And so a lot of my equipment is trying to get stuff as light as possible uh, for travel. Also, I mean, in America, when I'm here and there are most of the people, I, the painters I know here, you tend to drive to your spot. In Europe, if you can find one parking spot a day in a lot of the places I paint, you know, that's, you're not moving your car again. <laughs> so you, I, I end up walking a lot. And, a couple of years ago, I was painting in the snow. In the winter, I'm from California, I'm not used to driving in the snow, so I um, just walked up and down the Alps with very heavy equipment, and then that was when I decided I was gonna try to figure out how to lighten my gear. Right now, like I said, I'm pretty happy with it. This is a sort of first attempt. These are 3D printed palette cups to make them lighter. Um, not entirely successful. The idea was when I lift it up, put it in my backpack, the medium and the turps would sink back into here so I don't have to unscrew everything each time and refill it, but it, it has been kind of leaky everywhere. So it's not Can I ask you a question? Successful. Yes. How did you attach the mask to, because I have a surreal, surreal also, but what, what, is, what is this whole part? So this part here has a, when you buy it, it get, comes with these little, um, you know, they're, they have a screw in them and they attach to a camera, the right. base of a camera. So I just took that one that they gave me, actually, this is about the third time I tried it, I think I bought a few extras, and I attached it with carbon fiber to the mast. So this is all one piece. I can't use it with another tripod, for example. Okay. It only works with this okay. one. Okay. I mean, it's a ARCA standard mm -hmm. sort of attachment, but it's... Okay. Um, uh, I would like to try to figure out how to make these, and, some other people mainly just because I see people struggling with the weight of their equipment, but at the moment I don't have time or the know-how to. <laughs> are, are you buying your medium when you get there? Or? No, I'm getting it from uh, yeah. this guy who's, because uh, I tend to, if I can avoid flying, I never fly with solvents, but I also try to not to fly with this just because they can come. It's not flammable, but it's, um, you don't want to get confiscated. So I, there's a guy in uh, North Carolina who makes this. Um, yeah, I bought that, but I was just wondering how you get it on a plane. Yeah, no, I don't. I have like this one. Um, I had one ship to California, one wow. ship here, one ship to Maine, and then in Italy, the same thing. I'm fine. You good? Okay. Yeah. So um, just briefly, questions are great. I uh, I often sort of uh, I'll go through now my ideas on plain air painting, but if you have any questions, it's hard for me to concentrate often on making a mm -hmm. successful painting and talking. I know other painters can do it very easily, but my demo paintings are usually terrible because I'm more concerned about talking to you about what I'm doing. Before you get started, in a situation like this with the lights changing on us, the sun, mm -hmm. I would think, are you going to try to get an effect now or plan for an effect later? Or um, in a situation like this? That's a good question. It's, I'll get into that. There's a lot of ideas on that. Generally, I think that, you know, a lot of learning how to paint outside is sort of figuring out, learning how to predict a bit what um, what's going to happen. On a day like this, you know, I actually have a great weather app I use now where it actually gives you the 
sort of the cloud movement, it can, and it's pretty done a pretty good job of predicting it's even getting the fog on the, on the California coast. So obviously, if you, you know, were painting in California, where it was sunny every day, all day, and you could count on that. I was painting, teaching in Maine, uh, when was it, uh, a month ago? The students, we'd have a three-hour session. The students would get an hour of sun, an hour of fog, and an hour of rain. And you know, there's just no way to finish a painting. Now, if I'm working on my own, and it's you know sunny like this, and that's the effect I want, and it clouds over, I'll just pack up and come back the next day. Since you guys are just here for a few days, you have a, you're gonna be a bit more restricted. What I would say though, is if the light changes really dramatically and it's no longer the effect you want and you can't get that effect, you're better off just starting a new painting rather than fighting through, you know, trying to imagine everything is, is very difficult. I also, I find a great deal of inspiration it, you know, from my subjects, so a lot of my own painting is based on capturing the effects I see in nature and not really inventing so much. And so for me, it's important to be standing in front of something which is more or less uh, what I'm trying to capture. Now, on the other hand, one reason I like working outside, I can't really work from photographs when I, I've tried painting a painting from beginning to end with, from the photograph and they don't look good. People often tell me that my paintings look photographic, but when I paint them from photographs, they actually look really kind of painterly, more painterly than when I paint them like. But um, the, I see the changing effects as a great advantage because when you, if something changes and it was better than it was before, and then it becomes better, then you can chase that, we call it chasing the effects. You chase that effect and you know, make it, change it. If something gets worse, then you leave it the way it was. And I, I think it's a, a great advantage to work under changing uh, light. Now, a few things about setting up. Uh, you want to try to have your panel in the shade, your canvas in the shade, but you don't want to have it, you don't want to be tucked up against a tree where it's too dark, you know, where you don't get any light. Right now, I've got a bit of this, uh, the blue sky coming down on the panel. This is about a perfect uh, amount of light on your panel. Too little light and you'll end up keying it too bright. And if you have the panel in direct sunlight and you're not used to keying with direct sunlight, you'll key everything too dark. Basically, you want the, the end painting to be keyed right for a house or a gallery or a museum, which is more or less in shade. So something to consider. Try to keep your panel out of the sun and not up against the hedge or with overhanging trees where you can't um, see enough what you're doing. The sight size, the way sight size works, you basically need to have either a mast or an easel that gets up high enough. A lot of people use these pochade boxes on a short camera tripod where either if the camera tripod is high enough, you'll have the panel at eye level, but your paints will be under your nose or you'll have a, um, most of the time I see that people like to have the, you know, the shot box where it's comfortable to paint, but your panel's gonna be quite low. Now there is a way to sight size looking up and down. I find it more difficult to do, but I have done it before. Sight size, basically I'm imagining, you know, a little square the same size as my panel. I'll stand here where my, basically my nose is sort of down the middle, I mean, on the edge of the canvas where I'm looking. And then you have a, um, you know, I'll kind of flatten the scene out in my head and copy the shapes to the board. And the real trick to sight sizing a landscape is basically locking your head in in a way where if I move a tiny bit forward, everything gets much larger. You know, I see much more of the view. If I move my head back, everything, I see much less of the view as in relation to this, you know, panel sized square that I'm looking through. There's a, a painter named Joe, just my girl who's now selling like a little frame that you can attach to your um, panel at a little angle. And so that um, you can actually get used to looking through the frame. Um, but I tend to imagine the frame in my head how far do you stand back when you're doing your 
site size comparison? It depends. I mean, for a view, generally, if I'm using these small boards and I have a fair size view, I need to stand pretty close to it. But the other day, I what I was painting, those little boats that were on a rack, the, um, I wanted them a bit larger, but then, you know, it would be comfortable for me to stand about here. But since I needed them a bit larger, I took a step back and then the boats got larger on the panel and then I was basically sight size from a, a foot back from where I normally would. And you can also just do the drawing. You know, sight size, a lot of, it gets a lot of criticism for being uh, restrictive and it can be. I mean, if you go to a place like California where I just was and, and you have these massive views and a little panel, the only way to sight size a huge view on a little panel is to have your nose up against it, which is a really comfortable way to paint. And what I sometimes will do if I really want to sight size something that big is I will put my nose up just to do the drawing, but then I'll relax and, and do everything else um, from a distance. But so there, it is restrictive um, in that sense. On the other hand, for capturing effects very quickly, I think it's one of the, the best. It's originally a you know method for portraiture because you have to be, you know, if you're painting a portrait, and after the first half hour, the client's sort of peeking around to see, you know, how it's coming. You need to be fast and you need to be accurate. And so this is a very good way of being fast and accurate. I think. Um, so back to shapes. I'm talking to other painters lately. I keep hearing. Painters refer to painting as making, as uh, creating shapes on the canvas. I think it's an interesting idea, and it's something I've been thinking a lot about more. That I think one of the great things about, um, I think one important thing about painting that isn't really talked enough about is composition and um, design. I think there's a lot of, at least when I was studying, it was just kind of, you know, go out there and, and paint something. But the more I look at, I have a uh, shelf in my studio that's just failed paintings. You know, that I don't like, the galleries don't want them, and there's probably 150 of them on the shelf. And when I look at why they failed, almost all of them failed because the design was, was bad. And by, I'll go through some basic design ideas right now, but I think uh, who is it, uh, De Camp? Or historically, lots of painters have said that if you get the values right, nothing else matters. The most important thing to get right is the values. Now, I agree with that. I think you can make a great painting just with great values. But I do think the design for a successful landscape painting is very important. So, talk a little bit about some ideas of design. Color, ironically enough, we're outside with all these beautiful colors, but it tends not to be considered so important sort of the, the fun part of painting is the color, but it's the drawing and the design and the values that are really crucial, even outside in landscape painting. Um, so historically, too, you had, you know, portraiture was about showing the, the soul of the sitter or getting them married or um, still life painting was often about showing the sort of opulence, the wealth and the, you know, the artist would show all the different textures of the objects. Landscape painting historically was really about kind of getting the viewer into a view. They had all these tricks to, to get a viewer to go in, get a sense of depth. That's still really important. And there's you know, a, a number of ways to do it that I'll go over now. And you know, this view that I picked is a very easy uh, way to get a viewer into the, the painting is just a road you know, it starts wide and gets smaller. And all the elements, the trees here are larger, back there they get smaller. So there's a bunch of tricks to getting a sense of depth in the painting and they're very important. And they're important that you learn to look for them and maybe even exaggerate them if they're not quite what you want. Um, so, a bit about my palette too. I'm using, uh, they call it a chromatic palette because it's bright colors. Basically, it's the primary colors. So, and they, for big, quick color theory, if you don't know the, you know, you have three primary colors, which basically means you can't mix any two colors to get them. So blue, red, and yellow. 
and white. I have three blues. This is, the ultramarine is considered the, the red blue, the warm blue. Cerulean is considered the green blue or the cool blue. I use cobalt just as a neutral because I spent, for many years I didn't put it on and I spent so much time mixing a mix between ultramarine and cerulean, basically trying to get a cobalt that I just started skipping that step. I'm using two reds really. The, the This is a cad red medium, which is the cool red, the blue red, and a cad, it's a vermilion, cad red light from Williamsburg. All my cadmiums are from Williamsburg. The blues are from Old Holland. Um, actually, the Cerulean, the Old Holland Cerulean is crazy expensive. So I'm using uh, Williamsburg right now. Ochre is sort of the only earth color, the dull color I have on my palette. And basically, it's because, again, like the cobalt, I spend so much time mixing a kind of ochre that I just keep it on. Now, this is my and two yellows, the cool yellow and the warm yellow, and titanium white. Cadmium orange I use as well because it's, I first started putting it on when I tried to paint a citrus farm in Sicily and eat, I could not get oranges to be bright enough even if, with mixing the brightest, you know, hand ground, cadmium red and cadmium yellow, even an orange tree in shade uh, I couldn't get. So I started putting it on then and I find it very useful. You can make a very quick gray with, um, the cobalt blue, and it's the perfect color for often you get these sort of warms in the clouds. And because the titanium is sort of cool white mixed with the, even though the, the clouds often look kind of uh, red, the cadmium orange mixed with the white is perfect sort of low cloud color. So basically I find when you have a small limited palette, you tend to need to have specific colors from specific, um, companies because it'll change very dramatically if you if you use a different company or something. So like I say, I'm very happy with the Williamsburg cadmiums and the and uh, the Old Holland blues. The some people don't like Old Holland because it's very stiff. Uh, especially the ochre people hate it, but fine it works for me. The medium I'm using we talked a bit about briefly is this um, based on a recipe by a doctor who Van Dyke studied with, or sorry, Van Dyke taught. And he talked about a Strasbourg turpentine and the sun thickened linseed oil. Now, Strasbourg turpentine, they, he describes it as being straw colored and that you can't get that anymore. They sell like a really orange, brown Strasbourg turpentine and it, it sort of appears to crack like a Venice turpentine. So we're using something called Canada Balsam uh, because it's used in manufacturing. You can get very high grades of it. And it's a very good medium. I'll go into it in, when I start painting. That um, it's very good for the beginning stages of a painting because you can lay in very quickly and use less pigment and cover stuff quickly. It's good in the middle stages because you can sort of, especially on a dry painting, you can do what's called oiling out paint into that and you'll get sort of soft edges automatically. And it's great at the end stages of painting because it's a wonderful glazing medium. So um, you can glaze with it. Uh, now what about fat over lean? Fat over lean, over lean doesn't really apply for um, <clears throat> plain air painting in the, in the sense that they, you know, they say fat over lean in the sense of when you have a dry layer, you paint the next layer slightly thicker. Now the thing is that if you're painting before the, you know, oil paint doesn't dry, it, it changes chemically and it becomes a um, basically a different chemical substance, which is why you can't uh, erase a dry oil painting with turpentine, but you can a wet painting. So the fat over lean is if you have a layer that has dried to the stage where it's chemically different from what you're putting on on the next stage, but it hasn't shrunk uh, entirely. So it's really just that period from one month to six months when one layer is too dry to fuse with a, a wet layer, but it's not dry enough to stop moving. And then that moment you have to do fat over lean, but it's not really, with plain air painting, it's most times you're, you know, you're done in a few days and you're painting either wet over wet or at least wet over a, um, 
a layer that's dry enough recent, recently dry enough that it's just going to fuse into the next layer. Um, but it's interesting you ask that because one problem I've noticed, especially beginning students who aren't used to the, these mediums, have is they tend to try to use the medium the entire session, whereas I will stop using the medium and stop using turpentine at a certain point, especially if I need to do drawing over a wet paint, then I switch to uh, pure paint, which is fat over lean, technically, but fat into lean. Um, so it is actually useful in that sense. Now, if you're starting out, I think the best thing to do is to go around with a sketchbook and draw with a pencil their compositions, learn how to do thumbnails, uh, learn how to look for some of these design rules that I'll talk about in a minute and really practice drawing. I think there's a bit of an idea today because we see in museums and we see in art books, you only tend to see finished paintings. You don't realize that every single landscape you see in a museum, there was probably a drawing for it. Perot, Levitin. You look at these guys' sketchbooks and they're just full of drawings for um, all of their outdoor work. So. It basically, it'll get your drawing skills. You can only paint as well as you can draw. So doing a sketch every time is practice. It also is a good way to you know, figure out your compositions. I really like doing these little thumbnail sketches. Um, I have a sketchbook. You know, um, and then we were talking a bit about changing our effects. The other thing to think about when you're setting up, you know, you want to be aware of where uh, east and west are, you want to be slightly aware of where the sun's going to go. Generally, I start with, I key my sky first, we'll get into that in a second, keying everything off the sky. But you want to, if you're painting a, you know, a car or a boat or fisherman or something that is going to go, you know, that you have a chance of losing in your view, you want to paint that first. One advantage to sight size is if you put in, you know, a, your fisherman, and then put in a few of elements around them, then you can keep sight sizing after they've gone. You don't have, you're not using proportional measurements where you have to measure everything off of something that's now gone. But generally, I start with the sky. I was talking about keying the values. We'll get into compression of values. Generally, I start with the sky, but if I'm painting an effect that's or a, an element that I might lose, I'll start with that first. So then you have to be aware of where the sun's going to go. What we also do is called, um, we're either painting into an effect or painting out of an effect. Now that means that the effect, basically your effect is constantly changing. If the effect you want is more how you begin, you know, when you begin a painting, just say you're painting at dawn and the sun's very low, you'll have, uh, you know, this warm light everywhere. That effect is going to go pretty quickly. I mean, especially if you know, depending on how fast the sun goes up. If you paint in the, the winters, you often have these very low, you know, the sun goes down at an angle and you get these very long sunsets, and long dawns. Summer, the sun goes straight down if you're at the equator. The sun goes straight down, you get, you know, 10 minutes of, of the, the effect. So if you arrive at dawn and you have a dawn effect, what we tend to do is work more on the colors at the beginning and maybe mark the, the drawing of the shadows and then as the sun goes up and you lose your effect, then you do the drawing using the colors that you, you know, you noted down earlier. So you don't worry about the drawing, you worry about the colors and the values. Maybe some drawing in the shadows. The opposite is true if you're painting in the evening and you want that, the golden light at the end of the day. Um, you tend to, you'll paint into the effect. So you do all your drawing as accurately as possible, but you don't care too much about your colors and your values, because at the end of the day, that's all going to change dramatically. So now this, those are two sort of extremes if you're working at dawn and, and dusk. But even any time during the day, as you know, these dapples move across, you are constantly painting into and out of effects. So, you know, if you want to paint these dapples in a certain way, you know, if you like, if they design really well, you might put the drawing in of the dapples now and then do the colors a bit later if that you really want those particular dapples. So that's painting into and out of an effect. And it's something that basically happens on a, you know, a small scale all the time. 
Now, some subjects I'm painting uh, sort of with the, a side lit subject. This effect is going to stay pretty stable. You know, as the sun goes up, the dapples are going to creep towards the trees, but it's going to stay pretty stable for the next uh, two hours. If you're painting a, a north facing subject, or a south facing subject. Basically, this is looking south, north. Okay, so we're looking north here, north ish. Um, if you're looking north or south, often you'll get the same, a similar light for a great deal of time, especially if you're painting in the middle of the day. If you're painting looking east or west, you'll have, you know, at about at noon or whenever the sun goes over, everything's going to change dramatically. So that's the way that this course is set up, we'll be doing three hours in the morning and then three hours in the afternoon because you do one painting generally with one effect and one painting. Don't try to paint all day unless it's either overcast or, like I say, if you're painting a north facing, one of my favorite places to paint is a little town in Italy where you look at the north facing uh, walls of the town and you can get there at nine when the sun's here and can't keep painting until two or three and the sun is over here, but you're still painting these walls in shadow. I mean, so the accents kind of change, but the general overall effect stays the same. So that's something to be aware of too. I personally think a lot of the, the best um, plein air painters you see working today are, a lot of the most effective paintings anyways, are looking towards the sun. And maybe this is maybe because I, Look at a lot of Western art, but where you want the, the sense of the heat and the, you know, the only way to get the sense of, because um, there's not so much humidity in the air. We often paint looking towards the sun to get the sense of atmosphere and depth. If you're painting with your back to the sun, like if you look over on that tree line there, you notice how you can see every value of, I mean, sorry, every hue of every different tree. Recognize each little species. You know, some are yellow, some are blue, some are kind of gray. Every tree uh, really is distinct one from the other. If you look at the tree line here, you don't really notice the the hues nearly so much. It's basically all a similar value. Lights on the top, dark. So that's generally the idea. If you're looking towards the sun. It's going to be much more about drawing value. You see the atmosphere much better. You'll get a sense of depth and humidity or uh, atmosphere perspective much easier looking towards the sun. Looking away from the sun is much more about color, you know, the, the variety of hue. To me personally, I find looking away from the sun much more difficult. You know, I don't shy away from it, but I'm aware that that it's going to be more challenging for me. If um, if you look historically, you had painters like uh, Corot, almost every one of his landscapes is backlit. You look at someone like Soroya, all of his paintings are frontlit. Generally, a lot of the artists who were working on frontlit subjects would wait till the sun was quite low and paint the sort of golden light. So that's something to think about. I was arguing about this with some painters or discussing it. Uh, with some uh, Rockport painters, and they were claiming it was the opposite. And sure enough, I went and looked at all the Rockport paintings, and they are mostly uh, frontlit, so with the high sun. But a lot of the Western plein air artists are painting consistently looking towards the sun uh, with the high sun, and a lot of the English plein air painters do. So it's something to be aware of. Where is your sun? Where is it going to go? People ask about the, the side lit painting. Generally, you're not going to want to paint something that's perfectly uh, side lit. So it's still going to be either looking a bit towards the sun or a bit away from the sun. So let's talk a little bit about design now. Again, the um, I'm going to talk a lot about rules in the next uh, hour or so. I want you to know that when I say these are rules, they're not. Uh, you know, this is art, it's not air traffic control. You can break these rules, and often it's good if you do. If you go to a museum, often the painting that, that sticks with you the most, the one that you remember a couple weeks later, is the one that where the artist was breaking some of these rules. So I'll talk a bit about rules, but I don't want you to feel that these are things you have to do. They're just rules to make a uh, painting, you know, successful but you can make it even more successful by breaking them. I just think it's important that you know the rules before you break them. 
so some general design rules. You know, here I have this road. Now, you want to try to avoid putting anything. Also, uh, drawing with the, if you're just starting out and you didn't bring a sketchbook, you can also draw just your um, subject on the, you know, with uh, one tone on the color, and with one color on your board. I tend to use the um, ultramarine and a bit of ochre. So I often will draw kind of a center line to figure out where I'm going to place stuff uh, before I start using the line. Now, but the overall composition, you'll either have what's called a steel yard, which means you'll have a large um, amount of weight on one side of the painting, counterbalanced by a lot of empty space. Or you can have your subject more or less in the center. I tend to put stuff you know, a little bit off center and then counterbalance it with uh, empty space. So it's kind of a variation. I don't really like the the strong steel yard paintings, but historically they were very popular and, and uh, produced a lot of good work. Another thing briefly about picking your subject, uh, apparently Sargent would tell his students never to paint anything that was farther away than 50 feet, and Corot would tell his students to never paint anything that was closer than 50 feet. Now both artists produce great landscapes, but if you look, Corot's sort of close-up stuff is, tends not to be as convincing as his distances. And with Sargent, it's the opposite. Most of my favorite Sargent landscapes are close-ups, and his distance stuff can be a bit um, uh, less interesting. So I think this is generally true um, in painting, that a lot of learning to paint is also learning what you are particularly good at, what you are attracted to, what, what interests you, what you are good at at doing. So this is true, you know, that you see these um, still life painters who, you know, want to be landscape painters. They're great still life painters, but they want to be outside or portraitists who don't like being portrait painters, so they want to do landscapes. And some people are just really good at doing one thing and you shouldn't fight that. So like I'm a terrible still life painter. I just, I try, but they don't uh, come out very. Right? I can do maybe one object simply. But um, I don't have the, the sense for it. And so rather than spend my life trying to paint still lives, I've done other things. But the same goes a bit with landscape painting. There are people who are really good at certain subjects, distance, you know, looking towards the sun, looking away from the sun. I don't think you should constantly just bat out the same thing. You should always challenge yourself. But you should also be aware of your own um, strengths. If I have to paint in a competition, uh, I will generally, or if I have to do a quick painting, you know, if, I'm, if I only have one afternoon or something, I'll almost always paint looking towards the sun because I know that it's easier for me. So just something to be aware of. Um, so some more design ideas. You generally want to try to keep from putting anything too, infer too interesting, you know, on the edge of your painting. You want to try to keep stuff more in the center. The, um, I think one of the most important things in painting, for design-wise, is a variety of element size. I'll put it, but it's really, a few years ago, I, was, I had one, uh, I was in Amsterdam, and I only had three hours to do a painting if I had to catch a train. So I went out and I found this great sort of church tower, and then there was a barge. And after I had spent uh, an hour, I was just an hour into this painting, I realized that the tower and the barge were exactly the same size. And there was just no way of pulling this off. So I turfed it off, packed up, and went home. This is, I see this a lot in my own work and the work of other painters. Whenever I look at a painting and think, ah, oh, that's not very successful. Generally, it's because you have a whole bunch of elements that are all the same size. And it, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be that they're all the same tree. You know, you can have a tree and a car and a piece of, you know, water that are all the same size. Also, you have this, you know, we call it the flag where you have sort of the, the horizon or say the, you know, the, yeah, 
horizon, the mountains, and then the sky, and these are all the same size. Sometimes you'll have, a, you know, say a mountain coming down and let's say a little piece of land here. Basically this shape and this shape are exactly the same size. So there's lots of things that you have to be careful of, but I think the most successful way to begin a painting certainly is to make sure that your elements are, that you have a good variety of element size. Uh, then this idea of getting distance in our paintings too, we tend to want to, um, you know, like I say, if you look for stuff that's larger in your foreground, like here we have a dapple that's large here, medium size here, and then these tiny ones back there, you're immediately going to get a sense of distance in your painting if you do that. I often will, you know, and even if you don't, if, if there's the trees are thicker here and you'll get a thin, you know, a small dapple, and you get a much larger dapple there in the back, that's not going to be great design. You might want to walk a little bit further. Now, I tend to, I believe there was an English painter named Henry Fuseli who wrote that, you know, they were very into their idea of invention in painting. That invention was the great, uh, the proof of how great an artist was. He said that selection is the invention of the landscape painter. And I tend to do something similar where I will walk uh, you know, I'll walk back and forth, you know, 100 feet, basically marking with little X's in the, in the dirt all the views where I think it works. But to me, it's much more about selecting a view where I get these elements, you know, the way I want. And I'm not, there are a lot of good landscape painters out there, great landscape painters out there who will arrive somewhere and just change everything to fit their sense of design. And that's, something to consider. And like I say, these guys are producing great work. For me personally, I will just walk a bit longer and then uh, paint what I see. So, any questions? So was that remark you said about uh, selection, something about the selection is inventing a... Uh, the selection is the invention like I say, the invention they meant, often these uh, history paintings especially had this, uh, it was all about the invention that the artist could come up with the design and the elements and the story. Um, so that was sort of the pinnacle of painting. And he was just saying that for a landscape painter, basically selection, walking longer. Sorry. Um, so then, like I say, the next, most important thing is uh, to get the values right. Now, what I was always taught, and I find this very useful, was to key the sky first. Now here, we don't have a great deal of sky, but basically, the important way of seeing the values in when landscape painting, we do something that's called compression of values. And the idea is basically that you will, you compress the values of, um, of certain areas. It's really about not looking for distant differences in values, but looking for similarities, certainly in things that are, you know, light and shade in one element. So the trees here, you won't, people will often look at the light of a tree and the dark of the tree and, and exaggerate them because they're only looking at the light and the dark of the tree. The trick is to look at the light and the dark of the tree, squint, and then with your peripheral vision, compare them to the sky. And then you'll notice that all of these values are actually very similar. Everything in the sky is gonna be very, very light and everything below the horizon is gonna be very dark compared to the sky, unless it's white. But so if we look over there the, above the horizon, if you look at the trees, you know, if you look at the light hitting the tops of the trees, it looks really, really bright. But if you squint and look at the sky and then think, you know, don't look down, but think with your peripheral vision, how light is the light of the tree next to the dark of the tree if I compare them to the light of the sky. And the light of the sky is gonna be much, much lighter. So we compress the values of all the elements below the horizon. And the same is true, the opposite. People will often look at a 
you know, we see through these trees, we see a bit of um, clouds and sky, and they will, you know, say, okay, well, there's a dark blue sky, and then these white clouds, you know, and they'll exaggerate the this difference. You know, they'll have the white cloud and the blue sky, whereas in fact, the clouds are kind of a, uh, you know, warm gray. And the clouds, sorry, the, the clouds are warm gray and the sky is very light blue. And in fact, there's almost no difference in the values, just a slight change of hue. So that's compression of values, to really squint down, see the similarities, certainly anything above the horizon and anything below the horizon. Um, the other thing that, I will often do is I will actually look for, I was thinking about, you know, trying to make this stuff and make it available for sale. I thought I would have a, a, my logo be a little white patch and a little black patch next to each other. Not because it's particularly uh, interesting as a logo, but because I constantly look for pure white or pure black in my foreground so that then I can key distant values off of I like this backpack because it's uh, white, I, mean, I wish it was whiter, but um, it's just light gray and black. And so I can look, especially if you can find pure white, you know, if you can look at um, something white in your foreground and then, especially if the sun gets on it, and then key the clouds off of that. So if you look for something white or something black, you can often key, especially for finding atmospheric perspective, which we'll go into. I start talking about depth. This uh, the fact that things get lighter and bluer as they recede. It's called atmospheric perspective, and it's very hard. Again, it's something that students don't do. They're not compressing their values enough, and they'll look at just the light of something in the distance compared to something. Let's see. If you look over here. You see how those distant trees already in the. If you squint down and think. If you look at the, the tree here, the, the trunk, you think about how dark and how red that is. And then you look at the distance, the sort of the darks and the distance there, they're gonna be much bluer if you squint your eyes back and forth, but also bring your eye back to this to check it and then look back at that. And you can feel this sort of the atmosphere between that and that. And that's something you really wanna look for and you can exaggerate a bit. So, this is actually not going to be a very easy subject. It does nothing. So again, keep your skies very light. Uh, students will often do a, you know, a full gradation. If we go all the way up, the sky gets kind of an ultramarine up there. Cobalt sort of, you know, up, what is that, about 40 degrees into the sky. And then just above the horizon, it's very blue, sort of a cerulean, right? Now, don't do the whole gradation. I mean, really, what you're going to get in most landscapes is going to be only 30, 40 degrees off the horizon. And that's going to be cerulean and maybe a tiny bit of cobalt. So something to be aware of. You know, don't try to put the, paint what you see. So, like I say, we key the sky first. With sight size, I tend to do a lot of measuring just for the, the height. I don't do so much the width, um, but I will regularly hold the brush over, basically on this imaginary flat plane, touch it to that, and then locking my um, elbow, carry it back over. As you do your clouds, always try to find the small ones on the horizon and then the bigger ones higher up in the sky. One trick to compressing the values too is to always use the same brush. So I'm using the same brush for the clouds as I am for the sky because this humid, humid sort of sky, the clouds and the, and the sky don't really change greatly. Same for distant mountains, if you use the same brush, often you look at a field on a distant mountain and you say, okay, well, that's a yellow, a light yellow field against all these dark trees. But if you squint your eyes out of focus, look at the sun, uh, sky, you'll see that it's not a light yellow field on the mountain. It's actually a little bit lighter and a little bit yellower 
but it's still the overall effect is going to be this sort of blue this to know. Um, so compression of values. A little bit about the mechanics of oil painting. At the beginning, I use a lot of, I'll dip in the terps, I'll dip in the, sorry, in the medium first, then the terps, and then I'll put a bit of pigment. And the nice thing about this is that it, you can cover a lot more space much quicker as you're working. Um, so again, I try not to have stuff too obviously in the center. I'm trying to figure out the best composition here. You also don't really want to have strong diagonals leaving the corner of the, you know, you don't want the road kind of going out the corner of things. You want to either have it drop down before or go out of the painting like that. And it's going to be better going out. So you're using a round brush to go into the sky? Uh, yeah, no, it's actually filbert. All of my brushes are, I only use filberts really. I have a few rounds. But these are these little Italian, they're called cat tongue sables. These are from uh, an English company called Cornelison. These things last forever. There's an American company called Silver that makes something very similar. Um, Copper Feral. They have a nice spring to them. So I really like these uh, brushes. Another thing I do all the time is I measure angles with my brush. But the, the trick is to, you know, sort of lock your wrist and then bring the brush up and don't lie to yourself. I watch the students do this all the time where they go, okay, it's perfect. And um, so really lock your wrist, don't lie to yourself and bring this up. Generally, painting, one thing I've always thought about learning to paint is it's a bit of retraining our brains. Uh, it's kind of an evolution in a way, because I think uh, in a lot of ways our brains evolved to, you know, on the African savannas and we were, gonna, we were getting eaten and stuff. And there's all kinds of, of ways that are, you know, we see things and then by the time they hit our brain, it's been processed in a way that isn't very um, doesn't allow you to paint accurately. One of these things is we tend to look in the shadows and really students will pick out all the, you know, the, the differences in the shadow areas. You want to try to keep your shadows very simple, keep the focus on the lights, keep the interest in the lights. Um, The other one is that uh, I see this all the time with uh, our brains look for repetition. And this is one of the hardest things to, to learn not to do, is that when you're painting, uh, say, a distant line of trees, the, you know, you'll see a line of, say, cypresses in Italy, and the students will just go, OK, cypress tree, cypress tree, cypress tree, cypress tree, cypress tree. And you just, your brain is looking for pattern. We're looking for a repetition. And this is again, probably because we evolved to look at a, you know, a line of trees and not notice the difference because it wasn't important to us. They want, we wanted to try to just kind of generalize all that stuff. Whereas when you're landscape painting, the whole trick to this is saying, okay, well, let's look at that line of cypress trees and you've got one fat one, one skinny one, one that's perfect, one that got struck by lightning and really notice the, the variety. And that's, um, 
one of the big tricks in landscape painting is this variety. You want to have a variety of hue, variety of value, variety of shape, variety of edge. Um, but especially these variety of shapes and learning to really slow down, follow the rhythms in nature. I tell the students all the time, you can, because I think there's a bit, I'm actually taking forever this morning, which is great, because normally I'll finish these paintings in an hour and then, you know, the next three days, all the students will try to finish their paintings in an hour. And that's not, you want to take as long as it takes at the beginning to paint something accurately. And as soon as you paint it accurately once, you'll get faster. But if you try to paint fast at the beginning, you never get the accuracy later. So really slow down. Don't think you have to finish in one shot. Come back to the, the view day in and day out until you're accurate. And then you'll find that the, you get the speed. Uh, so. Again, I'm measuring my horizontals. Bit about mixing green since we're on uh, Long Island. There's gonna be a lot of greens. The you have three blues, three yellows, pretty much. My favorite uh, blue uh, green for um, these sort of mature trees, middle distance, is to start with the um, ochre and the cerulean. And you can take it a bit more yellow. Again, this is just a base green. So then I'll often you know, pick up a bit of the cadmium yellow if I need it. Um, A lot of medium and a lot of terps in the beginning stages to really cover. I also, I was trained at, at you know, a atelier probably similar to the one here, where we started with casts and we would have to draw these, uh, yeah, that set. And uh, I actually, I don't know how you pronounce his name. Studied with him for 10 years. Figure out. Um, so, but basically, we would start with a, an outline in the cast. We do the outline, then the shadow line, and then fill in the shadow. And I find I still do that uh, when I'm out painting. So I'll tend to sort of draw out an outline and then fill it in. At least this is almost all shadow. So, and. Uh, there's a, I always hear this discussion about whether to start with the lights or the darks. I tend to start with whatever is the larger element. So um, in this area, it's going to be mostly the darks. And again, this painting in and out of effect, now I've lost the sun. So I kind of want to see what's going on, if I'm going to get it back or not. You know, if I'm not going to, it's not going to come back. I either cut my losses and come back tomorrow or you know, I, lucky if I had had some drawing before and some colors, I could put those in, but. And then with sight size, you can constantly flick your eye back and forth. Once you get some paint down, I'll tend to constantly flick my eye back and forth. I'll check values, I'll check the hues, I'll check the, um, the chroma, just by flicking my eye back and forth and, and thinking about that one thing. So like here, this could be a bit bluer. But again, with compression of values, what I find is often very useful. I'm going with a bit of ultramarine to darken it. Rather than, I'll often say, okay, look at these leaves here are lighter than the ones behind it. But rather than going in and lightening those leaves, you know, if you see the two off the sky, these are actually really dark next to the sky. So what I'll do is I'll go in with the, the darker color behind and use that to sort of pull these out. Rather than trying to lighten areas, you want to try to darken the others and keep everything very, very uh, compressed.
when you get to um, a tree against the sky, the titanium is fantastic. I used to use lead outside it just forever to, to paint the skies. And to, you know, lead is wonderful inside for a figure. But outside, the titanium is terrific because it, the cover power is so good that um, basically the best way to deal with these sort of trees against the sky is to do get kind of general shapes. But you're going to start picking up a lot of the light. It's going to pick up a lot of the titanium. You'll have to constantly, I think a lot of times people don't realize that you basically get sort of one brush stroke in. You know, if you try to paint like that, the next brush stroke is already picking up a lot of the white. So you, unfortunately, the only way to do it is to just keep coming back and getting clean paint. It just takes a while. But, um, and then the same goes the other way. I tend to use, I'll go back and forth, the tree and the sky, using the tree to cut into the sky and using the sky to cut into the tree. But I'm not using a lot of medium now because I'm painting into this wet paint. I'm using almost pure paint, just a little bit of white and a little bit of, um, and again, you know, you maybe get one or two strokes and before you have to come down. And then, you know, I just did three little dots. You'll often do that where you just sort of, you know, you'll get on autopilot and your sky holes will all be the same size. And this happens to me too, you know, you'll start thinking about when you have to get the store on your way home or something. And, you know, your sky holes will be repetitive and the same size. And then I'll just stop and I'll go, okay, wait a second, That's, these are all the same size. Let's lose these two, make that one half as big. These are all in a line. If, sometimes they're in a line because there's three behind it, but, you know, these should be a bit smaller. And again, you have to sort of really slow down and observe. With sky holes too, artists will often do them a slight, slightly darker is good if you're picking up a bit of the paint and kind of a soft edge because in general when you're painting if you have a dark area with a really light element the eye is going to jump to that the same the opposite if you have a light area with a dark element you want to try to not you want to try to move the eye around not make this the focus of the painting we want to try to keep the eye down here on the road so these bright sky holes are maybe a bit much so you can soften the edge or darken the sky holes um, and again, because of, um, you know, if we take this image, this view in as a whole, all of the trees, when compared to the sky, are very, very similar in value and hue. Uh, so I'm just going to use the same brush and I'll add a bit of yellow and a bit of white maybe to these, you know, you see this, this other tree through the, the first one, which is going to be a bit lighter, try to get it against the sky. Um, but I'm keeping everything very compressed. using a lot of turpentine and medium to, to keep the paint thin at this stage. You said you hit the medium first and the turp? No, sorry, I, I did say that, but I meant the opposite. I often hit the, um, the turps and the medium. Actually, it doesn't matter. Uh, the turp and the medium. Yeah, it's about the same. So, but what I will usually do is make a little puddle and then put the pigment into that. Mark, you said that you used three basic greens. You used the... Oh, yeah, sorry. The first one was... Um, Ocre and Cerulean. Ocre and Cerulean. The next one is um, for the grass color. I'll use the Cad Yellow Light and the Cerulean. I'm sorry, you said Cad Yellow Light? Yeah, Light. With. and with cerulean and this gets you this very bright kind of a grass color now that's too bright so the different ways of, of knocking it down you can either use white but then 
you're going to raise the value a little bit, which in this case is going to make it slightly too light. So the other way of knocking a value down is, is with the greens, a good way of knocking value down is to use the ochre. That tends to knock, you know, it just gives you this nice kind of um, yellowish gray. I think that's one of the, a lot of times people try to lighten values always with um, white. I think if you can try to lighten your values with, especially in your greens, adding white tends to dull them too much, especially when we're using this titanium. And so a better way of, of dulling the greens is to add a tiny, a touch of the red to it. And that'll take it, you know, takes it a bit orange. You can add a bit more blue. Basically, a quick color theory is whenever you want to dull a color down, just say you want to dull down a blue, you add the other two primary colors. So to dull a blue, you add orange, which is red and yellow. To dull a red, you add uh, green, which is uh, blue and yellow. And to dull a yellow, you add purple. And it's just a quick way to get to gray. Um, so then again, I was telling, I was really struggling with the, I think all year when I've been teaching is getting students to, uh, to look for the blue in the atmospheric perspective, especially here on, on the East Coast where you have a ton of humidity in the air. Stuff tends to go very blue very quickly, any sort of distance where, where we'll go tomorrow you have, you see a bit out into the bays and the, you know, the second line of, uh, the second peninsula that sticks out is going to be, you know, almost blue, just a dirty blue, really. And students tend to look and say, okay, that's a tree, so it's green, and then I'll add a bit of blue to it. But I was trying to get the students to start with blue and then uh, kind of dirty it down. So these, the accents in this distant, and um, the trees in this distant field, you can basically start with a blue and add a bit of um, ochre and red to it to dull it down. But you really want to look for these, uh, the blues, anywhere, you, anytime you have any distance. Again, you only have a few ways of getting the eye to recede in a painting. One of them is to, to have this atmospheric perspective where things go duller and bluer in the distance. The other, you know, if you have a, often we have what's called an unfortunate tangent, right? Where you have a, this will be your little Swiss chalet, and you'll have a, the mountains behind that that are perfectly tangent with uh, the house. So anytime that happens, you want to try to you know have one thing break the the line of the other. So you know this, like I say, the three main ways you get the eye to recede are having large elements, say your big dapple in the foreground middle uh, middle size and then small dapples just pulls the eye in the other way is if you have you know we want to try to avoid also long horizontals that run the length of the canvas so what you'll do is look for stuff that breaks that um, and then this atmospheric perspective of having things get duller and bluer but really look for the blue in the distance so in that, in that example, the Swiss chalet there, would that be more delineated and the trees I, are grayed out? Yeah, definitely. But I would also just pull the, this was just to show you that if you have a, a line that defines one element in space and then another line that defines a, an ele a element in a different place in space, if they happen to line up, we call it an unfortunate tangent. Okay. And you want to basically have the element that's closer to you break the line of the one behind it. So, just something that happens on occasion when you're out. And something to, to look for and be aware of. In terms of how you frame your sequence of things, um, mm -hmm. is there ever anything to the sort of thinking of the visual order front to back? Like I noticed right now you painted two trees that are relatively foreground and you started to do the field behind them, kind of filling in this little center spot now. Um, which you just do carefully, I guess, to avoid painting over your foreground, or? I, generally, it works better if you start with the, like I said, I often <laughs> will start with the sky just to key it. And then I'll do, because I have uh, the blue on my brush from the sky, especially when you get down to the horizon, 
I'll tend to start painting the distances with that blue brush just mixing if, it, if I have a lot of distance. So I'll use the sky color, mix it into the, the distant mountain color, and then just start working my way down. People joke that I paint like an ink jet printer, my friends, because I tend to work my way down. But um, like you say, I will, if there's something that's gonna leave, I'll start with that first. In this case, you know, I wanted to get the large elements in. To, I'm basically trying to figure out where I'm placing stuff, but I haven't done a very active drawing in them concentrating on talking to you. So, um, but I tend to start from distance to foreground. If I have, I think whatever I have the most of. So if I have a lot of a distant view, I'll start with that. Here I have these large trees, which are the bigger elements. So I'll start with those and then work around them. Maybe it was just specifically filling in little bits of white unpainted canvas in the background. It's always, that I always find tricky because it's so white and you kind of have to end up hitting the edges of things you've painted around it, and then you, I guess, repaint or... Yeah, but because of these, hitting the edges of these trees are gonna be so complicated anyways. It's, and it's better, I think, to have the, the tree in first and then paint around it, because I'm gonna be going back and forth the whole time with the, the leaves and then a bit with the, the distance or the sky. And so it's gonna be going back and forth. I think it's easier. I can say the mass in the larger areas first and then work whittle and start whittling with the little other stuff. Great uh, tool for working outside. Can I use your phone for something? No, no, I want to put the screen on. Oh. Um, is a, a cell phone to use it as a like a piece of um, well? We used to use welding glass. We would take welding glass out with us. Basically, you can if you stand where you can see your view and the subject. If you look at it reflected in the mirror of your phone screen, you can uh, check values and shapes very easily. So you hold it basically along your, the edge of your nose, close the eye that's furthest from what you're looking at, look at the two in the same uh, view, because the brain is constantly, we were talking earlier about retraining your brain, but the, uh, the, um, the brain is constantly sort of telling you that your shapes are okay. You know, you're, it becomes hard to see the shapes but when you look at them reversed, your brain isn't really ready to see them like that, and you'll immediately see the difference in shapes. So it's something, you, unfortunately, I used to have this Nokia I love, but the screen was kind of beveled and I didn't work, so I switched to this phone because I needed a flat um, screen to, to use as a black hair. So I think be aware, but especially at this stage, but now is the moment when I would you know, I have some shapes in, but I'm just a bit concerned about some of these proportions. So I would get my phone out and check them. A lot of um, painting as well is you want to try to get, I was talking about variety. Like I said, I think variety is one of the most important elements in the painting. You want to try to get a variety of brush work. And often I'll see and the students will have their one, their small brush, and all of the um, small shapes will be done with that small, like the smallest brush you'll see everywhere, that width. What you want to get used to doing is not making your shapes ever just with one brush, but you always use the negative shape of the element next to that. So it's much easier, you know, you can get these real razor sharp little edges by using the color next to what you're painting rather than just trying to get it once with one shot. So I will almost always use the negative shape of what I'm painting next to whatever I'm painting and I will constantly push them back and forth, maybe from, you know, if you want this to get... Um, 
I don't think I understand what you mean by you use the negative shape that's next to where the painting. Well, here I'm painting the road. Just say I'm painting this little um, uh, sort of edge where it's a bit uh, darker, this kind of element where the you have more of the mud. Mm -hmm. So rather than just trying to paint it with um, with that color, You know, this is sort of the, the biggest stroke that I can get with, this, with my small brushes. Okay. I'll use the just the color next to it, which is the road color, to really whittle it down. You know, and I can get a really tiny little uh, brush stroke that I couldn't get, not brush stroke, a tiny shape that I couldn't get with just the. Um, okay, I The roads, you know, again, check your angles always with the other brush. I sorry, with the brush. Compress the value. So even though this grass is much lighter, I'm still going to use the same brush and lighten it slightly, but I'm still checking these two compared to each other and then also compared to the sky. Another thing, the uh, design element, you want to try to have, so here we have a kind of a field you see through the trees, but then it goes behind this tree trunk and then it changes. There's no, no more field over here. You want to try not to, there's something about painting where you kind of need to explain stuff more. Um, I mean, the great example is if you paint, if you take a photograph of somebody, or if I stand here with my arm behind my back, everyone will look at me and just think my arm's behind my back. But if you paint somebody like this, it looks like they have one arm. There's some, for some reason, an oil painting tends to need a bit more explanation than a photograph or seeing the subject. So these kinds of things, if you have a, um, you know, this field disappearing behind this uh, tree trunk, maybe just move a bit so that you see a little bit more of it coming out on the other side and that kind of thing. You don't want to have an element blocking a transition, a strong change. You know, you don't want to see the mountain sort of arrive behind the house, and then on the other side, there's no more mountain. So, again, soft edges are fantastic. But you want a variety of edge. But when you have like these kinds of, you know, on this very very soft cast shadow. So many of the edges in nature are quite sharp, so whenever you find a nice soft edge, really try to, to get that transition in. I tend to paint into the paint a lot. I'll soften edges by, you know, going up with the brush and I'll change shapes, painting into wet paint. I'll drag a brush, you know, along here to, to soften. So again, when you're mixing colors, you know, I just put this in and it's, the chroma's too high, sort of um, terracotta color. I'll add a bit of blue, which is the opposite, to try to knock it down. I mean, it's not the opposite, it's close to the opposite. And then you get a much grayer, in this case, adding the blue dark and the value a bit. So then I'll take white. I know you hate questions and all this, and I don't blame you. No, no, I, I love the question. Why? Well, I, I would, this white. I just like left. Why did you do that? No, I just uh, didn't get that. Okay. Again, I'm kind of jumping around all because right. I'm. Well, I'm secret I can make. No, no. <laughs> Sorry. You know what? One reason I probably left it is because it's kind of weird in nature. What, what is the color? What, what did you use for your path? Um, this is, I think I started with uh, ochre and then basically kind of tried to make it a warmer gray. Anytime you're struggling with color, it's usually a warm gray. So this, um, you know, the ochre is, chroma is a bit too high. So I added a bit of white to it to lighten it. And actually, as soon as I did that, just like I did now, I, 
thought maybe that's too light. But then when I'm going to dull it down again, I'm going to add a bit of blue. And again, the opposite of yellow, so I'll go for the lighter blue, because I don't want to change the, the value too much, and the lighter red. And then that'll get you kind of a, um, I think it's better the second time, this sort of, uh, that path color. Unfortunately, learning color mixing is a bit like, you know, it's like learning a language, and the, the color mixing is kind of the vocabulary, which is always the pain in the ass, learning a language. So you just basically have to learn to mix, you know, what colors work. And then, you know, like I said, the bases are very good. I, sorry, I was doing the greens before, and I only keep getting distracted. So we did the, the one green, which is the middle tree. It's the large tree mid-distance which is the, I use a lot, ochre and cerulean, the bright green of the grass, which is the, the cad yellow light, and the cerulean. And sometimes, like I was just in California, the, if the grass is slightly oranger, I'll use the, the redder of the, the bright yellows, and I'll go with the, the cad yellow dark. But where the cad yellow dark is incredibly useful is um, for our last green, which is sort of the, you know, trees in the foreground, when you need to get your absolute uh, darkest dark, we use um, ultramarine, cad red, medium. Basically, this gets you like a really, really dark purple. Probably a bit much. And uh, to kill the purple, we use the cat yellow. Um, the darker cad yellow, the medium. And then that gets you this very rich green. And again, if you step back and you see, check these, the green I've just put here against, say, the black of my backpack. Uh, it's actually pretty close. But you can, uh, you know, constantly check absolute values. Uh, look for something that's, I often look in the pocket or something in the dark, and then, you know, you'll already start to see atmospheric perspective at a short distance, especially here with all the humidity and the biting insects. <laughs> so, um, another, the uh, trick is not really that relevant here, but I'll talk about it, especially when we're out in the sun, is because of the sort of limited value range we get with oil paint, one thing that I often do is I'll find myself making stuff darker against the sky, and then you kind of gradate it down, and then by the time you get to the bottom here, it's gotten light again because we want to be able to show a darker value at the base. This often happens if you're painting a house backlit against the sky, a lighthouse. You exaggerate the darkness against the light sky because you need it to look light up there, but then you'll gradate it down because you need, when you get to the bottom, you'll need the, the, the dark grass or something to look lighter than the white house. And it's a very effective way of getting a, um, a sense of the light. The moment you put that dark value down next to it, it'll suddenly look like a lighthouse, you know, or a light subject in shadow against the sky. Now we're getting our sun back again, painting into effects. Um, you know, this is the moment that you want to, you have to kind of make a decision whether you want to keep stuff the way you had it or change the effect. I think your decision should be partly made on how realistic it is, to, you know, that that light's going to stay the same. But, you know, now we can put in some of these dapples. And again, you know, I often will hold my uh, brush, my hand with my pinky. You can also use another brush or a, uh, you know, you can find a stick and use it as a ball stick. 
And again, you can't get the shape small enough just with the, the brush most of the time. So you take the shape next to it and, and whittle it down to really get this. Uh... So here's a bright green with the, um, this is kind of the, um, the cad yellow light, the Cerulean and a bit of white. And again, I'll do my best, but it's not going to be good enough to get a, um, a thin line. And then I'll whittle it down with uh, the shape next to it. One thing you want to also look for a lot is reflected light. Um, you know, generally, especially right now, the this path is reflecting. You're just getting a lot of the reflection of the sky. Now, because the sky is basically white, it's not particularly interesting. But you'll often get a, a wonderful, especially in these uh, the white roads, you'll get these wonderful blues that are reflecting down from the sky. Uh, you'll often get reflected light coming, bouncing off from underneath, so you'll get a, a certain warmth under the trees. It's one big difference I find working outside um, from the studio is that you do get these, these wonderful, you'll get sort of, you know, real warm uh, reds under the, or oranges, where the light is bouncing up you know, underneath the, the trees. So you want to look for that sort of uh, the reflected light. Do you find it useful to mix the greens first, or you just go along? No, I tend to mix. Uh, yeah. I'll mix it even on the, the painting a lot of the time. You know, if I have a color down, something I learned from Andreas Smith in Rome, mix directly on your painting. This is my um, my working method. Most of the time, whatever you're painting is going to be gray. There's not a lot of times where you have pure color. There's, you know, if you're painting a blue sky along the horizon, you'll tend to use cerulean and white. Sometimes the, um, you know, these little, that accent there is maybe ochre, touch of red, touch of white. But for most of these colors, it's a mix of a ton of stuff. So I use these brushes, like I'll use, you know, this brush has been all of the different dark greens. This brush has been all of the, the sort of middle greens. The, so many of the colors, this uh, dirt, you know, the road brush will be the dark road and the lighter road. So, so many of the colors you use are basically grays. You know, we always say the world is gray. The, that I can use very few brushes at the beginning. But then when I need the little, you know, this bright color, then I have to reach for a clean brush. And the way I work, because I'm traveling a lot and I paint every day, I will go out with a handful of brushes like this, use very few of them, but as I work along, I'll need always a clean brush. And then this clean brush quickly gets dirty as I'm painting. And so then I need another clean brush and then this one will get dirty. And by the end of the week, all of my brushes are uh, dirty, sort of shades of gray, and then I wash them all at once. So that's my working method. You don't clean them every day? 
I don't clean them every day and I don't clean them while I'm working. I've seen very good painters who go out with two or three brushes. I mean, I'm in this quest for ultralight here and then I carry pounds worth of brushes. So I'd love to be able to use one or two brushes the way other artists do, but, uh, but they basically spend a lot of time cleaning in between. I just find this works for me. Again, you want to try to avoid having anything too interesting, um, too close to the edge. So I wouldn't put, say, I do see a bit of this tree here, but I would try to maybe, you know, I'll often step away or walk to get a slightly more picturesque um, thing to the term picturesque. You know, it, it means it looks like a picture and it tends to mean looks like a painting that was already done in a way. And so there's, a, I think generally picturesque areas had to have to be somewhere that a painter already painted or at least looked like, you know, another part of the world where painters painted. I think uh, Long Island has a long history of very good painters coming out here and Chase being a great example. And so it is a picturesque area. California as well, where, where I just was, had, you know, dozens of great painters going through there. Um, but I think having a, uh, an art historical knowledge of certainly other painters from that, your area can be very helpful for finding subject matter because, you know, if you're able to, especially when you're starting out, I would often look at a painting I liked and then go out and see if I could find a similar subject to that. And uh, especially if you take an old master or, I mean, a master from, where you live anyways. It's, I find it's a very nice way to go out and be inspired. And teach yourself this sort of, uh, you know, you, we are working in a tradition and I think it's very useful to, to understand what other people have done within that tradition. Soft edges, using this medium, it really helps you get these soft edges whenever you can find them. With the, regards to edges, like I say, variety of is important and variety of edges very important. There's a lot of artists who exaggerate the softness of the edges and I'm criticized by other painters for not, for having too many sharp edges. And so it's something to be aware of. I tend to like my sharp edges and um, a lot of painters prefer softer edges, but it's just, to me, it's something of an aesthetic choice. Uh, I try to paint a bit what I see. Actually, on that note too, I'm, uh, I have, I'm astigmatic, uh, my eyesight is blurry. I can't really see everything sort of blurry in the foreground and blurry in the distance. And I have glasses, but I don't wear them when I'm painting. People tell me they like the way I simplify, but I'm actually not simplifying anything. This is how I see the world. I do the same thing. I yeah. take my glasses off, so I don't see, I just see blur. Yeah, well, I put take it, your glasses yeah, off, man. Especially when you're laying in. I put them on in the studio before I'm shipping the painting out, just to have some idea of what I'm mailing to the gallery. But I do find if you have bad vision, it, it can be a advantage. So again, you know, very small element back here, kind of this, um, the light here is kind of medium sized. And then as you get up to the foreground, we have a much larger shape. So you want to try to look for subjects where you have large, medium, small, and then, you know, especially with accents, like in the grass and the trees, look for a large accent in the foreground, a medium size in the middle distance and small accent. You'll often find they are repeating, you know, if you look across this field, you see these patches of brighter grass, put them in brighter, larger in the foreground, and medium, small, razor thin at the distance. And it's just an easy way on a sub, you know, on a, basically that can look very flat otherwise because it is sort of all of it the same. So if you look for these elements, medium, or large, medium, small, as they go back, Another thing that's very, this is incredibly useful in painting and not enough painters do this, 
is to take a break. Just sort of stop, go get a cup of coffee, you know, check your phone, do something, walk your dog, stay and then... Hmm? Stay away from Facebook when you take your break. Yeah, maybe. Or... <laughs> depends on how, how <laughs> terrible it is. Um, but just to, to take your eyes off your work for a second, because I find when you come back, especially if you're really good thought, thinking about something else, again, just like looking at, your, at the mirror, you're using this, the mirror, you'll see the errors just when you come back with a fresh eye. So it's very important. So again, really follow at the beginning stages the rhythms in nature. You know, don't try to invent slowly work your way along and, and say, okay, well, there's a little branch and a big branch and then the, it kind of goes in and this comes up like that. And I tend to push the pain a lot sideways. My brushes, when they're old, they, they sort of file down the points because I'm using the side of the brush a lot. Um, but the variety, rhythm, that, that sense of um, really being attentive to the rhythms in nature, I think is really important. Compression of values, keep everything, you know, even though there are a lot of light accents and dark accents in these pine trees, I'm really keeping them, I'm just using the same brush still. You know, you can take it, don't think of it as there's a yellow part of the tree, think of it as there's a yellower part of the tree. But the overall effect, you barely notice it. So keep these all very compressed, you need to make an area lighter. See if you can make the area next to it a bit darker instead. Um, we also tend to keep the shadows thin. The main reason is if you put impostos in the shadows and the brush strokes, um, when, they're, when it's lit from above, it'll pick out the, you'll see the little accents on the, on the actual brush stroke. So, Historically, we try to keep the... Um... Well, did you just say if you have to make an area lighter, see if you can make an area darker? Yeah, like over here, rather than trying to lighten up some of these uh, branches with white, which I see people do, I'll just take the, the area next to it a bit darker, uh -huh. and then these will look lighter. Right. But I'm keeping the values very compressed. Right. Now, do you link your darks or anything? No, but I try to simplify the shadows. You want to keep the elements quite simplified. There's also an idea in painting of um, to err on the side of beauty. This was something I was always told, and I think it's very useful. We were taught this mainly in portraiture. Err on the side of beauty. The idea is you're always going to get it slightly wrong. It's, you're never going to have a perfect and accurate uh, copy of what you're painting. So if you are going to be a bit wrong, make it wrong in a way that especially in portraiture, flatters the subject. But out here as well, make it wrong in a way that where there's a bit more logic, a bit more beauty to the scene, a bit more distance, a bit more depth. So if you're if you're not gonna get the the blue mountain, you know, the right hue, make it a little bit bluer, a little bit lighter, give us a bit more distance. So try to err on the side of, of logic and this, uh, you know, creating a space. The other thing about trees is you don't have to paint every leaf, but what often is very successful is just sort of on the edge of the, the tree, if you can give us the, some of the leaves, you know, you don't have to go up all the way, but along some of these shadow areas, if you just pull out, and again, I'm compressing the values, keeping everything quite dark, and just pulling these out a bit, I, a lot of times there isn't really any way around just actually slowing down and painting leaf by leaf, especially in important areas. And like I say, you'll get much quicker at it. So it's tedious at the beginning, but it's really the only way. Now there is some kind of reflected light on these. This could be slightly too light, but... Okay? So your yeah. brush is... Oh, sorry. I was just going to ask about the, the tree that's closest to dark that you used, because that really made everything go further back quickly. So what did you use? You mean here? No, the tree on the right. Yeah. Yeah. Which, when you put that line in, it just... You mean the, the trunk? Yes. The, yeah. So the darkest color we can get, and that's, we'll use it a lot, 
is ultramarine. Again, I'm just using my same green brush here. Ultramarine, cad red medium, and cad yellow medium. And I like, I never use black outside. I like mixing my darks because I find that you can take it like, you know, for the trunk of a tree, you want to take it a bit redder. Um, you know, and then you can take it a bit bluer. You can take it a bit yellower. So it's, I mean, I prefer it to mixing. I mean, I prefer mixing my darks than, than using that. I was going to ask about so your brushes never get overloaded with paint? You're not wiping down at all with a cloth or a... No, I mean, if I need to get the paint off, I'll put it on the... Wow. So, I mean, this is quite laden, but yeah, I'll definitely sort of sometimes, you know, try to get some of the paint off. Oh, wow, that's so interesting. You don't ever get muddy, Mark? No, I do, but I think you want, I want to be muddy. I want everything. If you look at a Vermeer, what's so beautiful about Vermeer's painting is it's all mud. It's like uh, browns and greens and grays. And then these little accents of really pure color really just pop and glow. And the same out here in landscape painting. You know, most of your colors are going to be muted uh, browns and greens and, and grays. And then those few little accents of maybe a bit much in the center like that. But um, these few little accents are going to you know, pop out and really look beautiful next to all of these muted color. But you have to place the accents early on so they... No, you can definitely later. place them later. I mean, if this, but for example... When it's pretty dry, or are you gonna just put it right back no, on? No, you can wet them when on the wet. The only thing is you'll constantly have to go back for more paint. Oh, and, right. and you'll have to paint about. quite Quickly, quite thickly, so there's no medium or turpentine in here. But you can, you know, like I say, you can cut out the sort of the, the shapes of these um, the leaves here. And again, the, you know, this kind of repetition. I just did it without thinking because it's just a natural thing for us to, you know, to look for similarity. But really want to afterwards look for those and make sure they're not, you know, cut them out. This is sort of an unfortunate tangent here to this. Um, you know, the path kind of curves and then it goes to the under the tree like that. So you either want to drop these leaves to, to break that distance. So you design to change sometimes during the painting a little? And then you took the... Yeah, I definitely, um, you know, I copy what I see most of the time, but if there are elements that I think are more picturesque to remove them or change them, enlarge them, I'll do it. So it's not bad. It's just nuances. Yeah. Uh, to me, it's really about finding a view and then it, it's kind of, I don't know, I really like the, the sort of respect and slow sort of meditative appreciation for the view. And that's part of why I do paint like this. I also, I often try to look for when I first got to Florence, we studied a lot of Neoplatonic thought, which sort of Renaissance into Platonism, which had a lot of, they were constantly incorporating symbols into all the paintings. And so I often will go out and I'll look for a view that has a meaning. Sometimes you can't, you don't really know what the meaning is, but you feel like there's a meaning there. And other times you'll see something that has like an obvious connection or an idea that you, you know, you want to express in your painting. And I find that a very, uh, a nice way of being constantly inspired to look for meaning everywhere. Another thing about inspiration is I think that it's, it's like a, any other muscle where if you go out every day and you say, okay, I have to find something that inspires me, you get very good at finding stuff that inspires you. And like Sargent and all these painters talk about how they could go out the front door and see a bunch of views within 10 feet. I remember when I was starting out 20 years ago, I would walk for hours and not see anything. And now I can go outside, I can go to an area where, you know, if I have to paint 
um, where I uh, you know, it's actually somewhere for a reason, I can find something that inspires me almost anywhere. Then the question is figuring out a, a successful painterly, yeah, picturesque design within that subject matter, which can be a bit harder. But I find inspiration everywhere now, and I didn't use to. So I think it can be uh, like any other muscle and then to, to get better at it. The moments beget moments. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, actually, in fact, now one annoying thing is I'm constantly inspired, so I I feel guilty. Like, <laughs> like my whole drunk, life right? is just like this, yeah. Like, ah. Well, I'm also, I just can't paint all the time. So I'm driving past all this incredible stuff. And I should just stop and paint. Yeah, it'd be a dinner. And, and so... I don't paint as well as you, but I have a problem yeah, with that too. Really frustrating. So, anyways, yeah. The titanium white is fantastic for getting sky holes, again, look for variety. If you find yourself doing a bunch of sort of repetitive sky holes, go back in and um, with your green and and really just pay attention, be sensitive to the rhythm that's there. And you'll find you use, as you're working over areas, like if I want to cover the sky, you can take a palette knife, get some of the paint off, or you can just no paint, I'm sorry, no medium, no terps, just pure paint, and really, um, you know, you can cover it over. And, and then as you're working along, you'll find that you have to go back and forth with pure paint in the, the titanium and pure paint in your... Uh, Green. So you go back and forth with the sky and the green mass to define the leaf edge. Yeah. And again, really just slow down and follow what's actually there in nature, and you'll eventually get quite fast at doing it. But if you try to do it fast at the beginning, you'll never get accurate. Does your white brush get at a point too dirty you can't, when you're trying to hit those light values? Yeah, it, it definitely could, but I find that the titanium is so good that I'm able to um, just keep adding enough titanium. I can wipe it off too. And, you know, there was this idea I mentioned earlier about uh, with sky holes painters will often make them slightly too dark. And you can do that against the, the edge of the trees as well, where you, you know, use a dirty your dirty titanium brush slightly darker and it's going to give less of a sharp um, you know eye attracting edge to it. <laughs> 